Hi all, welcome. Um, my name is Lori Jacob McNulty. Uh, I am a well-being advisor, wellness advisor for the Office of Intramural Training and Education. I'm also a licensed mental health professional um, in the DC area. And I'm glad today to be thinking and talking about self-awareness strategies, um, particularly as it relates to positive mental health um, and sort of thinking about this in the biomedical research environment. So I will be um, uh, talking today for about an hour, maybe a little less, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions, and then we'll go into small groups. So I want to start by thinking about even sort of this definition of self-awareness. So the it's the awareness of our own personality, of our own individuality. It's attending to ourselves. But more than that, it's about using this self-evaluation, using these thoughts and this thinking about ourselves to determine, is this how I would like to be? Is this how I would like for things to be going? Is this matching my values? Is this matching, you know, getting me to my goals? And then using that reflection as a tool for action and a tool for change. So I'm probably going to be using self-awareness and self-reflection interchangeably. But I like to think of self-reflection as this learning process. So developing that awareness and then using that awareness as an appraisal tool to evaluate and then to give ourselves feedback about how our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are in alignment with the values and goals. And then this helps us eventually lead to changes in problem solving, we can build skills from this, we can make future plans, we can adjust, we can change our relationships to ourselves and others. So self-awareness and self-reflection is this process. Um, it's often an internal process, but we're going to talk about how it's aided and supported and by others. But it's a process of sort of the reflection part, the evaluation part, the alignment part, the feedback part, and then the change part. So I kind of really like this quote from Crane and colleagues. Um, they did a very interesting study that we'll talk about on the interplay of systematic self-review and self-reflection and building resilience. Um, but that learning doesn't automatically come from a success or a failure, right? Something doesn't happen to us and we say, oh, okay, well, now I know. Right? We have to willingly engage in this process of thinking about it, right? Of evaluating it, of making changes, and like that's where the learning comes from. So this probably could be its own lecture of internal and external self-awareness and how well they match. But I just want people to keep in mind that sort of internal self-awareness is clarity in how we feel that we see ourselves, what are our values, what are our passions, what are our goals, how we determine how we see ourselves. And external self-awareness is our knowledge and understanding of how other people view us. Um, and so skills and empathy, skills and understanding other people's point of view, that's external self-awareness. How are we aware of how other people see us? So there's these sort of two categories. Um, sometimes they match, sometimes they don't match. Um, but these are sort of different, different categories of self-awareness. I think that self-reflection as it relates to wellness and positive mental health, there's research on this being a spectrum with low self-reflection on one side and heightened self-reflection on the other side. And what happens is when we're on either end of this spectrum, it impacts our wellness and our positive mental health. And in the middle there, there's what I'm going to call sort of adaptive or helpful self-reflection. So low self-reflection is this idea that we're not really thinking about ourselves. We're not evaluating what's going on for us. We're not slowing down to take the time to say what's going on for me and um, how did that work? Or did I like the way that I reacted to that? Or what am I feeling about this? We're not really slowing down to take the time to look inside of ourselves. And that leads to diminished wellness, diminished positive mental health, because we're not really able to build that self-awareness and then make changes um, and modify things accordingly. On the other hand, we have heightened self-reflection where we are thinking too much and we're ruminating and we are getting stuck inside of ourselves and ruminating about what we're doing and 
our faults versus other people's faults and we're really getting stuck and we're ruminating there and heightened self-reflection on the other end of the spectrum is correlated with anxiety it's correlated with depression and in the middle is this adaptive self-reflection and we're going to talk about how do we get to that middle part a little bit more so there's you think about the outcomes if you're not reflecting at all right you're going to have a difficult time with really getting a realistic view of yourself what's going on for yourself um, what are the things you're happy with what are the things you'd like to shift and change if you're not checking in with yourself you're going to have trouble understanding the perspectives of other people right how might people be viewing me this can lead to difficulties in empathy difficulties in pro-social behavior right so behaviors that are going to help you connect and stay connected with other people in a healthy way. We're going to have trouble monitoring ourselves. Okay, well, I didn't respond to that email for a week, but it's probably fine. And we just don't think about it. We're going to have trouble with cognitive flexibility, right? If we're not willing to look inside of ourselves and say, what's going on with my thoughts, feelings, behaviors, then we're going to say, that's fine. And then it's going to be really rigid. We're going to struggle with that flexibility, which is going to then make making any kind of modification or changes to our behavior hard. It also impacts resilience, right? Because if we're very rigid and we're not willing to look inside of ourselves and we're not willing to say this is hard and maybe I need help with this, then it's going to be really hard to sort of change, understand, and add coping skills that we need for resilience. On the other end of the spectrum, we can have hyper rumination, right? So we can really think about ourselves a lot and we can say this is, um, all my fault or things aren't going well and we get really stuck in this self-awareness and this hyper fixation of thoughts of what's going on for us oftentimes that comes with cognitive distortions which we're going to go through some cognitive distortions that come up for struggling with sort of hyper rumination and sort of heightened self-reflection we personalize often so when we're thinking a lot about ourselves we maybe take things personally that don't necessarily have to do with us this my mentor canceled on me four times they must not like me or they walked into the lab and they didn't say hello right away so that means that they're irritated with me we are sort of focusing very much on ourselves versus being able to see the bigger picture sometimes which then would lead to social anxiety and difficulty regulating our emotions, particularly the ones that come up in self-awareness, which are often blame, shame, fear, guilt. And then that makes it really hard to move forward. We get so stuck in these things and there's a lot of distortions around them. It makes it hard to access resources, to ask for help, to build coping tools. So we want to move closer into this adaptive or more helpful self-reflection. When we can do that, when we have helpful self-reflection, it creates a lot of positives for our mental health, for our well-being. These are just some of the um, positive impacts that I gathered from the research, and there's probably far more, but thinking about if you can be self-aware in a way that feels realistic, that feels helpful, that's not ignoring issues and not totally getting stuck on issues, then we can feel more confident, right? You can say, okay, this is something when things come up, I can think about it and I can make changes and I can handle it. We can feel more creative, right? We become more flexible in our thinking. Our relationships get better, right? Because I think we've all probably been in a relationship with somebody who either fixates too much on themselves or doesn't really take a look at what they're doing. <laughs> so it enhances relationships. It makes decision-making easier. The communication that you have with others becomes more impactful because you're more aware of what's your accountability versus what other people's accountability is. And it helps you regulate, right? If you can say, what am I feeling and what can I do about that? There's emotion regulation, there's stress management, and it also gives you a sense of control, right? When we don't reflect at all, we feel like, all right, things are just going. <laughs> if we reflect too much, we start to feel a little bit out of control and we hyper focus often on the things that are out of our control. But if we have a realistic perspective of what's going on for us, it increases our sense of control. There's a lot of um, literature on self awareness and work outcomes and job satisfaction, better leaders, more effective leaders, more profitable companies. So thinking about if you can be reflective at work, then that can really help in a team environment. And so much of science is done in a team environment where we need to take a look at what are we doing and what are other people doing. Um, it also 
like we said, improve, like I said, improves resilience capacity, right? So you can understand what am I doing now? Let me think about what I'm doing now to cope. Um, what's helpful and unhelpful about my coping gives us this increased belief of self-efficacy and competence and control when we feel like, okay, we have a way to move forward through hard things by taking a look at what our role in it is. And also we're more willing to conceptualize what are the changes that I can make here and pursue those changes. It also impacts positive mental health. So much of, you know, as a therapist, so much of therapy is let's talk about insight. Let's talk about self-awareness. Let's talk about which parts are in your control and are out of your control. And so much of mental health treatment is often about improving self-awareness in a realistic and kind way. So more often than not, we are less aware than we think we are. So just sort of having this in the back of your mind, there's some um, connection between, you know, we think we're super self-aware of how we're being and then someone who knows us well might say, okay, well, actually that's really not at all how they are. And so just that to say that, you know, this is a skill that we can continue to work on. It's an iterative skill and that we, um, we can't expect an exact match, but if we continue to build self-awareness, we'll continue to have a better and better insight into ourselves. But there's a lot of things that challenge that cultivation of self-awareness. Um, there's a lot of things that make self-awareness kind of hard. And we're gonna spend the next section kind of talking about how do you manage some of those challenges, but I wanted to just bring them up here and say, self-awareness and our practice in it and our own relationship with it is deeply impacted by background, by our culture, by our family, by our history, by our identity, right? So these are things that, you know, some people maybe grew up talking and thinking a lot about themselves. You might be from a culture where it's um, less individualistic. So this is maybe doesn't come quite as naturally, or it's something that takes a little bit of a different, um, meaning for you. So thinking about that, I just, I want to sort of be clear about that, but our background and our culture and our history and our family and our identity and our experiences have a lot um, of impact on our self-awareness. Also harsh and unhelpful self-talk, right? So if we're really hard on ourselves, that makes self-awareness challenging, right? Because even when we do take a look at ourselves, it's going to be a more harsh view than maybe is realistic. We also maybe are dismissive or avoidant. Oh, it's fine, it's fine, I don't need to think about it, right? And so that kind of self-talk also lends itself towards struggles with self-awareness. And the truth is being self-aware and taking a look inside and saying, what am I doing and what's going on for me? That's pretty vulnerable, right? So that requires a lot of vulnerability. It requires a lot of being able to understand the emotional states that come from that, regulate those states, oftentimes get support around that. So this can be hard. Um, it can also be hard to take responsibility, right? Sometimes we end up blaming just as a deflector because the emotions that we can that come up for self-awareness can be really painful. We can just want to avoid that or feel perfectionistic. Like if it's not right, it's a total disaster. So I don't even want to think about it. Or I get so stuck in it that I can't get unstuck. Um, there's, you know, limited access to help having other people sort of that you trust to be able to gain um, accurate self-awareness. There's time limitations. Some of us don't have time to sort of sit down and think about things. We got to keep things moving. We feel burnt out. Specific mental health needs. Often there are struggles with um, inherently in the mental health needs with self-awareness. Like I mentioned before with anxiety and depression, we tend to be on that heightened end. So your mental health needs might be impacting it. And there's also neuro differences, right? So we don't know exactly where self-awareness is in the brain, but we can um, think about it as likely has in the prefrontal cortex. And so neuro differences also make a difference in self-awareness and self-reflection. So there are a lot of ways to sort of help with these challenges. So I'm gonna go through these um, and talk about how critical they are as you develop your practice of self-awareness. And then I'm gonna talk about a sort of a systematic way of self-reflecting that helps build resilience and also some other tools that you can do as you're building your self-awareness. But if we don't start with how do you manage some of these challenges, then it becomes hard to use those tools. So the first one is 
thinking about how to manage cognitive distortions and unhelpful thoughts. So if you've been to the Becoming Resilient Scientist series, or you have engaged in any kind of cognitive behavioral treatment, these will look familiar to you, but cognitive distortions are the characteristic ways of thinking that are unhelpful. They lead to um, this heightened self-reflection often, although they can lead to avoidance as well. But these are things that we get stuck in when we start to build self-awareness, when we start to think about, um, when we start to think about ourselves. So discounting the positive and minimizing is this idea of um, completely kind of fixating on those um, things that we think, oh, well, that should come easy to us. So, okay, well, you did a really good job and you got a paper published. Oh, but it was a simple paper, right? We kind of dismiss the positives. Oh, well, you got into this wonderful internship program. Well, yeah, but they only picked me because of X, Y, and Z. So we kind of discount and dismiss the positives, um, which can lead to imposter fears. I don't really belong here. But then we also maximize the challenges, right? So maybe 10 things went well and one thing went really poorly and we hyper-focus on that one thing. Well, yeah, sure, I did X, Y, and Z, but really they said I should be um, doing this other thing and, and we hyper-focus on that. And when we're building self-awareness, we need to notice, am I maximizing the challenges and discounting all the positives? Rumination is a big one where if we are thinking about ourselves and we get stuck on something, it can run again and again. A fixed mindset. We talked about difficulty with cognitive flexibility. If we're on the low end or the high end of that self-reflection, if we think, oh, well, it's never going to work. Well, or I'm just bad at this. It doesn't really give us a lot of wiggle room in our self-awareness. Okay, well, so now I know I'm bad at this, but then I guess if I'm bad at it, there's just nothing I can do about it. We become really harsh and we catastrophize the worst case scenario is gonna happen for us. And so it makes self-reflection sort of um, feeling uncomfortable, but also it, it just, it can lead us into a spiral where we don't get to use that part where we move forward and come up with tools. Overgeneralizing is this idea that, okay, well, this, this something bad happened in this circumstance, so it's always gonna happen. So, you know, I had a committee meeting that was really rough, um, therefore I'm not good at committee meetings. Emotional reasoning is this idea of once I feel something, um, I'm having a feeling, so it must be true, right? I feel really upset about this and I feel like I'm doing a bad job, so I must be doing a bad job. It doesn't leave a lot of room and self-awareness and self-reflection to grow. And then all or nothing thinking, which I'm gonna circle back to, that's a huge one for self-awareness, which is, I should have done this. I, it must be awful. They should have listened to me. We have to do it this way. When we're getting into self-awareness, cognitive distortions, the cognitive distortion of all or nothing thinking can be really, um, can get in the way of sort of helpful self-reflection. Fortune telling is predicting the future. I know what's gonna happen already, so why try? And mind reading. So I know this person feels this way. In order to manage this, we can think about this acronym HAS. So hearing our unhelpful self-talk, that is the first part of self-awareness, right? It's I'm noticing what I'm thinking. So even to just slow down and notice um, this might be a cognitive distortion and appreciate that you have a choice around that, that we can fact check cognitive distortions, that they're not automatically true. And then talking back like a realistic giraffe. Now I realize now that I just pulled the giraffe slide out, but giraffe is a concept from nonviolent communication where we talk to ourselves in a helpful, kind, realistic, self-compassionate way. So talking back in a more helpful, kind way, and then seeking help and resources, because this can be a really hard thing to do when we're stuck in our cognitive distortions. I want to talk a little bit more about that talking back piece, because I think that's often the one where we get stuck. Okay, I recognize that that's a distortion, but I'm deep into it, and it's hard for me to think about it in a different way. So slowing down to notice and think about what distortions might be showing up for you when you're doing self-reflection and thinking to yourself, is this a helpful way of thinking or is it maybe harmful or unhelpful? And being particularly aware of this absolute all or nothing thinking. So if you're self-reflecting and you're hearing a lot of I should have, they should have, we should have, this always happens, this never happens, this, these extremes, that'll clue you in that you might be having some cognitive distortions. I 
never get my paper past the review committee, or I always have more comments than everyone else, right? There might be some distortions there. And then just like you would with any kind of experiment to look for evidence to support that hypothesis and to counter that. So um, I always have um, trouble at journal club. People always have a lot more questions for me and I always feel like I'm never doing a good job. Well, what about that one time, right? Where can you think of some of the things that um, went well and what are the things that aren't going well? And then how can we make changes and modify? Finding more alternative, helpful, kind thoughts that are more nuanced. When we end up in these sort of all or nothing places, we need to get, if you think about that bell curve, back to the middle where things are a little more nuanced. And then finding help from other people because oftentimes when we're in our distortions, it's very hard to shift away from that by ourselves. So finding trusted others and having conversations about this. Um, if you're really stuck, some things that can help in self-reflection are writing it down. Sometimes saying things out loud or even talking into a mirror can be really illuminating. Like, is that what I sound like? Or that just doesn't sound so realistic when I say it out loud. Responding to yourself as you were talking to a friend. What would you say to a friend in this situation and asking for help? I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about accountability versus blame. So something that gets in the way when we're self-reflecting is blame. We want to figure out why. Why is this happening? Why am I in this situation? We want to know, our brains want to be able to place blame. We want to do that, right? Because we want to be able to have certainty. I need to be able to make meaning of this. I need to understand this situation, especially complicated and stressful situations. Even if it's not realistic, I need to know where to place the why, where to place the blame. In Brene Brown's research, she talks about blame as a discharge of discomfort and pain. I'm uncomfortable and I need to know why so that I can avoid it for the next time. It can be directed internally. I can blame myself and be really hard on myself or it can be directed externally, it's your fault. This discharge of pain, I just gotta know why. This happens especially when we don't have all of the information or when things are really nuanced because our brain is trying to sort of fill in those gaps and oftentimes it'll more than happy to fill in the gaps with um, unpleasant or sort of negative biases. So if the primary goal is to find blame, we're gonna wind up in all or nothing thinking, right? It's rarely the whole picture and it actually diminishes our ability to take a realistic accountability for what part is me in this, what part are the things I have control over, what are the parts that I didn't have control over. It helps our self-reflection when we can see this in a more nuanced way, and then we have some better choices to make change. Um, so thinking about if you are the kind of person or if you tend to end up a lot with looking for a blame, think about shifting that as you self-reflect to accountability. When we are developing self-reflection, a huge piece of the puzzle is self-compassion. So Kristen Neff does a lot of research on self-compassion and you can look at her website and she describes these three core components. So self-compassion is mindfulness, self-kindness, and common humanity is the core components. So mindfulness is the idea of non-judgmental awareness of what is happening. That's that self-awareness, the first piece, what's going on for me, rather than over identification, which is this means this, this is this, is, I got to get stuck here, I'm going to ruminate about this. So, really, just what is happening rather than trying to make a whole bunch of meaning off it right off the bat. Self kindness is the idea of treating ourselves kindly, right? Being kind to ourselves, not being so hard on ourselves, having compassion for ourselves as if we would other people, and common humanity, which is, I think, something that maybe gets left out a bit, which is. These are normal or expected parts of being a human being it's that we struggle with these things. It's hard to self reflect. It's hard to be self aware. It's hard to label our emotions and regulate our emotions in the moment enough to say, where is my accountability here? So we, it really helps to develop a self compassionate way of talking to ourselves as we're doing the self awareness practices. So one way to do that is to move away from this idea that there's a dichotomy of if we're, if we're compassionate with ourselves, then we're pitying ourselves, or that we're just being overly optimistic and ignoring all of our faults. Right? That's not self-compassion. Self-compassion is 
I can think about what happened without taking on all the blame. <laughs> or I can take an appropriate amount of accountability here. Or the situation doesn't define me, but I, maybe I did make some mistakes and maybe I can learn from those. Or people make mistakes, that's how we grow. Thinking about questions and self-awareness that are compassionate, which is what's my role here and what parts do I not have to take on? Or which of my thoughts and actions in this situation do I want to cultivate and which would I like to modify and change, right? It's not, oh, I should never have done that. I can't believe it. I made such a huge mistake and I messed up and I screwed up and I shouldn't, I don't belong here. It's okay. Well, what's my role here? What, where can I take responsibility? The other thing I kind of like is this idea of a compassionate response to ourselves. My initial reaction doesn't define me. So sometimes we get really angry or we get really down or we avoid and then we get really hard on ourselves for that. So we we are harsh on ourselves for um, even our own reactions. So self-compassion is saying my initial reaction that doesn't define me. That's what I went to and that's okay. And I can also think about making changes. Um, there's the development of a growth mindset, which also is pretty critical as self-awareness. So growth mindset is this idea that we can learn and grow whether or not something comes easily to us. So Carol Dweck talks about this and it's the power of yet. It's not that I'm not good at this, it's I'm not great at this yet, right? That we have this capacity to learn and grow. When we are stuck in a fixed mindset, self-awareness is I'm not good at this. Okay, that kind of leads us at a little bit of a, um, a dead end, but can we shift to I'm not good at this yet. This isn't the way I really wanted to handle this in this moment. Where can I learn and grow from this, right? It opens up our cognitive flexibility, which opens up our problem solving. It allows us to really examine a situation rather than getting stuck rigidly in something. And we can explore new approaches. Um, we can also, once we can explore new approaches, that means that we can learn from them. We can ask for help. If we're like, well, I'm not good at this, well, what are you going to say to somebody when you ask for help versus this is something I need to grow on. Maybe I can get support of this. It helps us learn from our stakes, it regulates emotions, and it helps us develop resilience. Part of self-awareness is becoming, I keep saying our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. It's this emotions, the feelings part. So Brene Brown um, just in the last couple of years, wrote a book um, called Alice of the Heart, all about the nuances of emotions. And her research shows that pe most people, even though there's, I think she says 87 different emotions, the people can name usually three as they're happening in the moment. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry. Well, first, the first thing we need to do is just develop an awareness, a language around emotions, right? And I like this emotions wheel. If you look up emotions wheels, there's lots of them. And, at the bottom of this slide, there's um, a link to the 87 emotions. <laughs> but thinking about, well, am I feeling um, anxious or am I feeling helpless? Am I overwhelmed? Am I feeling inadequate? So even providing nuance to the language that we have will help us build a stronger awareness as you're doing that self-awareness piece of what am I even feeling in this moment? And then from there, we can try to then regulate these emotions, understand them, understand what they mean, um, what they're trying to tell us. I kind of often will talk about emotions as lights on the dashboard, right? There's something there that we need to attend to. So recognize them, acknowledge them, breathe deeply, which is calm your body down enough that you can sort of start to use a mixture of both our emotional mind and our logical mind to think about them and then be with them. We don't need to suppress emotions. We don't need to judge them. We don't need to fix them right away. We often have a strong desire to sort of get rid of challenging emotions. I'm sad and that made me sad and that's okay. Or I got a review back on my paper that was way more in depth and I'm gonna do way more work than I thought I needed to. And that makes me feel really disappointed. And it makes sense because I was hoping for something different. So just being with our emotions um, learning to sort of interpret them. So being particularly aware of that emotional reasoning distortion and then making a decision, right? Not making a snap decision based on the emotions, but slowing down, thinking about our emotions, trying to interpret them and then deciding, am I going to take action or not? And very importantly, seeking support and guidance when needed, because when things are really emotional, it can be really hard to 
do this alone. <laughs> so I just want to talk about being with discomfort and being able to sort of tolerate discomfort a bit. So looking inward and increasing our self-reflection, that's inherently uncomfortable, right? To say, where did I make a mistake here? Where did I maybe mess up? Where did I have my ouch moments? Where did somebody that I trusted really kind of um, disappoint me? It's just an uncomfortable thing to do often, right? So in order to improve this adaptive self-awareness, we need to be able to tolerate the discomfort of working through it. And we need to be able to say, this is uncomfortable and it's important. So I just wanna be very clear that tolerating does not mean you tolerate the behavior of people around you who are acting in unacceptable ways. Tolerating is not just suck it up and deal with it. That is not the definition of tolerating. Tolerating here is this is hard for me and I can manage it and I can work through it and I can continue to try to practice self-awareness here, right? So tolerating the hard emotions that come with it. So the ability to withstand or endure uncomfortable or unpleasant emotions while taking helpful actions. So sometimes that means that, okay, I gotta look at this, I'm not gonna like it, but it also doesn't mean I have to completely get stuck in it. This is gonna make me feel a little uncomfortable in the short term and that's okay and that's expected and I can regulate. Doesn't mean um, doing self-awareness when you're in a super heightened state and you can't regulate at all, but just knowing like, okay, this is gonna be kind of uncomfortable. So when we have uncomfortable emotions without regulation, without that rabbit's piece, without support from others, without trying to think about how to interpret them, without managing our cognitive distortions, we just have this need to like fix these hard emotions for ourselves and often for the people around us, right? which means we're, we're, not, we're just trying to get rid of them, to deal with them, to fix them, to make them go away without saying, okay, well, I can tolerate this for a little while because it's gonna be hard while I do it. We maybe we avoid, we blame ourselves or we blame other people. We ruminate and we get stuck on things. We become unable to really fully understand the situation. If all our goal is to solve the problem and get rid of the feeling, oftentimes we're like, well, okay, I know that this is part of the problem, so we'll just do this. We don't really see the whole picture and we can make ourselves and other people feel dismissed. That's not really what I was trying to tell you, right? If you're trying to fix the emotion of the people around you or fix your own emotions, we don't necessarily feel really heard or understood. And we also maybe make choices that are inconsistent with our values or our goals, right? If our value is, I really want to figure out how I can take accountability in this moment, but I'm just trying to get rid of this uncomfortable emotion then maybe we end up not taking accountability. However, if we can become aware of these emotions, if we can accept that they're a part of it, we can tolerate, try to regulate them, then we can modulate our responses in the moment. We might avoid some of those unhelpful behaviors and those snap responses that we give. We maybe can actually initiate self-reflection that's in the middle of that bell curve and we can increase our belief and our trust in ourselves. I think oftentimes I'll hear people say, I don't actually trust myself to manage this. But if we can say, okay, that was hard and I managed it, then we gain that confidence that we can handle hard things. So as we're talking about emotions in, in um, self-reflection and self-awareness, I think it's pretty critical for us to bring up shame. So shame is one of the most painful things we tend to feel and it's, this experience of believing basically that we're flawed. There's something wrong with us. We're not worthy of acceptance. We're not worthy of belonging. Some people might say we're not worthy of love, right? Shame is experienced by everyone. And there's this intense fear that it creates about dis disconnection and what it means about ourselves, right? And so these stories of I'm bad, I'm unlovable, I'm not valuable, I'm not worthy, I'm not capable. This can come up as we're doing self-awareness. So I want to talk a little bit about developing some resilience around this. We might avoid self-reflection or if shame is really strong, we may end up really stuck in that rumination and that all or nothing thinking in this, these fears and then we struggle to move forward. So there are some, you know, in educational and research environments, there's some things that drive shame. 
eight. So these may seem familiar to you, right? There's shame around asking for help, needing help, shame around things not coming super easy, shame about making mistakes or things not working out the way you wanted them to, shame about even needing time away, shame about saying, I can't work on this experiment until 10 o'clock every night this week, um, or I need a break. There can be shame about choosing careers that excite you if they're not, you know, what you think your mentor would like you to do or a path that you thought you wanted to be on. And then struggles, shame around struggles that you have with colleagues, with mentors, right? That things should just be working smoothly. And so to develop some of the resilience around this shame, right? We want this ability to connect with our authentic, our authentic selves and to stop hiding and to have self-compassion. So recognizing it, when these types of situations come up, this is where I tend to feel shame. When I don't get the grant that I thought that I would get, or when I have a conflict with my mentor, or when the committee meeting doesn't go the way I thought it would, um, or when my trainees are um, not getting along and I feel like I'm not being helpful as a mentor, right? There's recognizing the context and then finding supportive community. So. The thing about shame, and I have this underlined, is that we have to, Brene Brown says, speak shame. So shame likes to hide. It doesn't like to be spoken about. That is what helps it thrive and grow, right? If you're feeling unlovable, unworthy, um, that you're bad, of course you're not gonna wanna share that with people, right? And so then you get that feeling and then you collect evidence for that feeling and it grows. But hopefully you've had the experience of saying, did the most embarrassing thing, or I can't believe this happened, or I'm having a really hard time, and somebody says, you know, I've been there, or yeah, that sounds really rough, how can I help? That sounds, uh, you know, we get that common humanity, and that's what ultimately really helps. So we don't have to find somebody and tell them the thing that makes you feel the most shame, but what you can do is start in a low stakes situation and find the right people for the right situation. And we're gonna talk a little bit about finding people that we can sort of help with this shame resilience and practicing self-compassion using good coping skills but really shame resilience is about connecting with other people so as we have gone through this these are a lot of things that we need to keep in mind for self-awareness um, to have a helpful practice of self-awareness and i want to talk about this this is a a bit of a scaffold for a self-reflective practice. This is not the only one, but I really liked this because it felt like a good sort of um, place to start that gave a structure. Um, there's lots of different ways to have self-awareness and self-reflective practice, but I liked this one. So I want to start, um, this was a research um, paper on sort of this systematic self-reflective practice to help strength and resilience. And since we talk so much about resilience at OITE, I thought this would be a nice place to start. So this is a, the idea that like something stressful happens, there's a life stressor, and how can you sort of build this self-reflective practice? So first on the left, we have the situation focused pieces of it. So this is something stressful happens and you just become aware. What are the emotions I'm having around this? What are the physical sensations I'm having around this? What are the thoughts that are popping up for me as a result of the situation, knowing that they may change? But just sort of becoming, it's that mindful, um, the mindfulness we talked about, of just what is happening for me, right? And then we identify the triggers. What's happened that has brought about this reaction? The more specific often you can be, is the better, right? So you don't wanna say, well, it's my mentor or I just have a bad group, or it was that reviewer. So the specific is my mentor canceled four meetings in a row with me. Um, and then I stopped responding to their emails and that's really kind of triggering for me. Or um, this reviewer gave me twice as many reviews as I thought that I would get. And that number of reviews was hard for me, right? So being specific about what is this trigger and then together, these will better help you understand the difference between thinking about what your initial reaction would be versus what you're hoping it'll be. So this is that personal and professional values and goals. So the values are more of a larger scale sort of idealistic, what are my overarching values that I wanna live by versus goals or what are the things that I'm trying to get to? 
and then thinking about what was my reaction, what were the triggers, and what how would I like to respond? What are my values? What are my goals? Then you get to reappraise um, your initial reactions, reappraise the stress, um, and thinking about how will this what other actions can I take? What are my, what's my accountability in this? And so thinking about this as what's happened, what triggered this? How does this align? How does my reaction in the situation align with my values and goals? And then going back and reappraising it. So the first three parts are more about seeing that particular situation. And you can see in that situation the demands and the stressors, but hopefully then we start to think about also where are the opportunities. The next stage is this developmental stage. That's more of a broad strokes reflection. So thinking about um, evaluating how that process went, evaluating how um, you're feeling about your reaction to it. Is this helpful or harmful in moving towards my values? Is this helpful and harmful in moving towards my goals? And then also future focus. What can I do to plan for next time? What are things that I can problem solve? What are resources that I can reach out to? Who can I connect with to help with this, right? And so seeking um, more future oriented sort of is the last piece of the systematic reflection. And I just wanna keep in mind, this takes preparation and practice. This is an iterative process. It's not like you're gonna go through this systematic reflection one time and you've made your reflections and you've made your changes and that's good right this is also not a straight path this is not you do this once and you get better and better and better every time hopefully there will be pieces of it that feel better but we are human beings so we're going to move backwards and forwards right things are not linear in terms of growth it also is important as you're doing this type of self-reflection to think about when is it best to do this when you're not hyper stressed when you're not so stressed that you're feeling like your frontal cortex is not online when you're not hyper emotional when you're not physically in pain right thinking about the time to do this when there's discomfort but it's not so overwhelming that it's hard to think things through and sometimes this is helpful to do in a supportive context so it's interesting the author even talks about like doing this within the context of a supportive friend group or or trust of others or a therapist sometimes this self-reflection Often that's what we're doing in therapy is thinking about our reactions and thinking about how, how is this aligning with what you're hoping to be and how, what changes can we make. So if it's something you can do internally, but certainly it's something you can do with others. So speaking of finding others to do this with, there's this idea of loving critics, right? So they're respectful, they're kind, they're honest. These are not people who put you down and say, well, you should have done this and you should have done that. And I know I told you this, right? And then they're also not people who wash over things. No, oh, that was wonderful. And that was all their fault. And it has nothing to do with you. And you're perfect, right? So the thing is, is like, we've probably all been in relationships like both of those things. And, you know, maybe the people who say, oh, well, it has nothing to do with you. Maybe that feels kind of good, but we always know. And maybe there might, we feels a little off. Maybe there is something I should be taking accountability for. These people are not perfect. So, you know, people will, say things that kind of upset you or kind of disappoint you or make you feel a certain way. So thinking about them sort of in an overall context and it requires vulnerability. So starting with small things and notice when I share something small with this person, this is how they make me feel. This feels safe. This feels like they responded in a way overall that felt helpful versus oof, that made me feel really judged and I'm not, I don't know that this is a safe person. And also keep in mind the appropriate boundaries in the context of each relationship. Your loving critics for one thing could be totally different than for another thing, right? You wouldn't share the same thing with a mentor that you would with a spouse. You wouldn't share the same thing with one of your um, employees or your trainees that you might with um, one of your mentors or one of your peers, right? So thinking about who to go to for what is pretty critical. Other tools in self-reflection um, beyond this sort of systematic, um, journaling is a big one. So you can journal, you can look up self-awareness prompts um, and journal based on that or just free journaling, thinking about things. Um, using a mirror or recording yourselves, I find recording yourselves, of course it's really uncomfortable, but often people will say like, is that 
what they sound like, like that doesn't sound right to me, like, or that's not right at all, right? So thinking about saying it out loud and trying to really hear yourself, creating meditations and mindfulness practices and imagining yourself in someone else's shoes. What might someone else be thinking about how um, this system is, or this situation is going? Taking care of your full self. So when we are burnt out, when we're not taking breaks, when we are not engaging in fulfilling activities, it becomes hard. We lose a little bit of that self-awareness, right? Because we're just go, 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 go. And we lose a bit of that ability to sort of slow down and reflect. So filling our own cups, taking care of all the parts of yourself will support a helpful self-reflective practice. And then creating a pattern, right? Creating routines. Maybe you have larger scale routines where every six months you sit down with your mentor and really think things through. Or maybe you have small routines where on Friday afternoons you go for a walk and you think about, you know, your values and your goals and sort of where things are. Um, creating support networks. We talked a lot about how important other people are in our self-awareness and our self-reflection. And then seeking professional support. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because when we are on those ends of that spectrum, oftentimes it can be really useful. I mean, so much of um, support, professional support, is about creating helpful, adaptive um, self-awareness that ends up more in the middle than on those ends. So therapy is a place where you can engage in that self-reflection in a safe, supportive, non-judgmental, confidential environment. It gives, it's sort of like an experimenting ground, right? You don't you're in this place with this person who is able to help and support you, but you're not, there's not, you know, they're not writing your recommendation letters or on your tenure community, committee, right? So you can sort of have this safe environment. It can help relieve our suffering and improve our functioning. And you can address specific areas. Like this is really, it's really hard for me to leave work at work. Um, so thinking about that. And then you know, working with your therapist, you can sort of tailor the pace. Um, there's also, if you're suffering um, medication tailored, so you can talk to your primary care physician or a psychiatrist um, as well, in addition to therapy. So there's some factors to consider. Um, and, you know, thinking about all of these things, and I just want to acknowledge stigma. So culture, background, identity, um, there's stigma around therapy and I under, you know, I'm thinking like that, that is something to also keep in mind, something that also makes things hard, um, especially if you're going and saying like, it's not really within my comfort zone or it's not within my culture to be talking about myself, to go there to just talk about myself. But if you are struggling with what you want to do, what you need to do, or you're suffering, it's worth considering. There's some resources that I have around finding a therapist and finding um, supportive, inclusive environments for therapy. And then um, here are some resources um, for all um, that OIT is providing. So the Raising Resilient Scientists, that's a series specifically only for mentors. Um, this mental health series to join the listserv. And then the Becoming a Resilient Scientist series talks more in depth about a lot of these resilient skills, um, as well as a lot of resources on YouTube. So that is all. I'm happy to take a few questions, Jen, I think.